Hello, everyone. We have a large attendance today. My name is uh, Harvey Dong, and I'm a lecturer in Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies at UC Berkeley. And I'm also part of the staff here at Eastwind Books of Berkeley. Uh, first, I want to acknowledge that our location is on unceded Ohlone lands and wish to thank the Ohlone people for its use. Uh, this event today is co-sponsored by Eastwind Books and the following units at UC Berkeley, uh, Asian American and Asian Diaspora Studies, Asian American Research Center, the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion, and the Center for Buddhist Studies. Uh, we also have many copies of uh, Chen Sing Han's book, Be the Refuge, Raising the Voices of Asian American Buddhists, and encourage your support in purchasing signed copies from our website located at www.asiabookcenter.com. Uh, my colleague, Professor Carolyn Chen, will take over the rest of today's event uh, in introducing our guest, Chen Sing Han. Uh, a little bit about Carolyn Chen. Uh, she is an associate professor of ethnic studies at UC Berkeley. She is the author of Getting Saved in America, Taiwanese Immigration and Religious Experience. She's the co-editor of Sustaining Faith Traditions race, ethnicity, and religion among the Latino and Asian American second generation. And she's also involved in writing a forthcoming book on Asian spiritual practices in Silicon Valley tech companies. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce uh, Carolyn, who will introduce Chen Sing Han. Okay, Carolyn. Thank you, Dr. Dong. It's such a pleasure to be here today and really such an honor to be in conversation with Chen Xing. Um, I have been waiting for a book like this to come out on the contemporary experience of Asian American um, Buddhist for so long. And this book is uh, such an important, important contribution to the scholarship on Asian American religion and on Asian American Buddhism. So it's my great pleasure today to introduce Chen Ching Hong. She is a Bay Area based writer whose publications have appeared in Buddha Dharma, Journal of Global Buddhism, Lion's Roar, Pacific World, Tricycle and elsewhere. She holds a BA from Stanford University and an MA in Buddhist studies from the Graduate Theological Union. After studying chaplaincy at the Institute of Buddhist Studies in Berkeley, California, she worked in spiritual care at a nearby community hospital in Oakland. And Be the Refuge is her first book. So welcome, Chen Xing. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for the introduction. And it's such an honor to be in conversation with you today. I remember when we met, I think, first in person, probably in 2014. And of course, by that point, I'd already known of your work, had worked it into my master's thesis, a thesis that, unbeknownst to me at the time, would become this book. And you were very much encouraging. And your research on Taiwanese, American Buddhists, and Christians very much inspired my work as well. And I just want to briefly say thank you so much to East Wind Books. I fondly remember when we used to live just a couple blocks away from there and also remember all the way back in high school when I was living in Washington State, just how mind blowing it was to realize that a bookstore that's been around since 1982 devoted to Asian American literature was even possible. I think that had not even entered my consciousness at the time. So it's just a great honor to be here and thank you to all the co-sponsoring uh, to all the co-sponsoring departments from UC Berkeley. And of course, thank you so much, everyone who's taken the time to be here with us today. I see many familiar names and also new names, and I'm just very touched that you're all here and grateful for your attention. Looking forward to your questions as well. And I thought to start, I could read just a very short section from my book since we only have an hour together here. And for those who have the book and want to follow along, it's on page 224. So this is from the final chapter of the book, which is entitled Solidarity. And I'll be alternating between, it's sort of me speaking and then between quotes from someone named Aaron Lee, whom we'll be able to talk more about shortly. In one of my favorite parts of Wan Wan's November 2014 film interview, Aaron riffs off 
on why it drives him crazy when people think all Asian American Buddhists practice Buddhism in the same way. It's the notion that if you go to Fa Ying Si, this temple in the San Gabriel Valley, everyone you talk to has the exact same idea and they do the exact same thing in terms of Buddhism. You wouldn't know that if you talk to different people there, they all have different reasons for being there. Aaron brings up his friend Gary as an example. Originally from Hong Kong, Gary volunteers every week at Dharma Seal Temple, Chinese name Fa Ying Si, directing traffic. When he was unemployed, Gary had made a vow if he were to get a certain job that he needed to support his family, it was a good blue collar job, he would become a regular volunteer at the temple. He prayed and he got the job. The reason why I bring this up is because I think on the one hand, people will see this and they'd be like, oh, that's what Asian American Buddhists are. They're those people who want material things and they pray for it. But Aaron urges us not to be so dismissive. For starters, who isn't inclined to take action to pursue what they want, whether through prayer or some other method? Furthermore, volunteering at the temple changed the way Gary practices Buddhism. Being at the temple all the time, he interacted frequently with the monks and nuns and developed a deeper understanding of Buddhism through their teachings. That's a really cool story. But a lot of people stop there at this notion of Asian American Buddhists are just immigrant, superstitious Buddhists. And I think it's true that if you go to a temple and you look for that, that's what you'll find. Aaron compares this to going to Paris with a list of all the things you want to see. Sure, you'll come home having met your expectations about the city. But if you go to the Chinese neighborhood where Aaron's uncle lives, you'll experience a completely different Paris than if you hit up all the tourist sites especially if you don't grow up around Asian American Buddhists and all you know is what your mostly white Dharma center teaches you about what Buddhism in America is, you're just hearing these legends of these Asian Buddhists and their communities yonder. Aaron isn't bringing all of this up to be divisive. It's really sad that stereotypes prevent people from understanding American Buddhists for who we are simply because I like to think that if we were part of one community, we'd be greater together than we are apart. In fact, Aaron's message is the exact opposite of separation. I'd like to think the reason why diversity is so important is because each of us sees the world through a different lens. We only see a very narrow piece of the world. And so when you get all of our perspectives together, we have a better understanding of what the world is and how things work. We have a better understanding as Buddhists of how people suffer and how to alleviate suffering and how to work together as a community and support each other as a community. Thank you. Thank you, Chen Xing. that was beautiful. Um, I think that one of the great strengths of your book is that you really show the um, complexity and the diversity of the Asian American uh, Asian American Buddhist community and Asian American Buddhism. Um, and you know, one of the things that you highlight in this book, and one of the central themes, is anger, um, which is not a word that we typically hear in Buddhism, right? Um, Buddhism in Buddhism, it's it's often considered a form of mental defilement. <laughs> and yet you write in your book, this beautiful line that quote, anger can be a skillful means and you compare it to a controlled burn where preventing the devastating fires of racism and inequity that plague our societies. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about Aaron Lee, who is, um, um, who plays a prominent role in your book and is the well-known angry Asian Buddhist blogger. And if you can talk about him and the significance of anger to Asian American Buddhists. Absolutely. So I want to also acknowledge, I think Aaron's mom is on the call with us today. So thank you so much, Naomi, for being here with us. Um, I first knew Aaron, not as Aaron, but just as the angry Asian Buddhist. Here's a postcard actually that Aaron once sent to me. And 
Correct. This is a blog that Aaron Lee started back in 2009. The title riffs off the title of the Angry Asian Man, which I think many people in this audience will be familiar with. And Aaron wanted to look at similarly issues of race and representation, but in American Buddhism in particular, especially since he noticed mainstream representations of American Buddhism were so dominated by white convert voices. And so he actually wrote anonymously, in part to protect his identity, and in part because he kind of felt anyone could have written this and felt strongly about these issues. So Aaron himself was Toysanese Chinese, multi-generation Toysanese Chinese on his father's side and Ashkenazi Jewish on his mother's side. And his own connection to Buddhism is rich and complex as I detail throughout the book, Be the Refuge. And I was very fortunate that when I started my master's program at the Institute of Buddhist Studies in Berkeley, in the Graduate Theological Union, that my advisor, Scott Mitchell, actually was very active on the Buddhist blogosphere of that time. And so was Aaron, of course. So my advisor put me in touch with Aaron and I told him, you know, I have this idea of interviewing young adult Asian American Buddhists. I'm really inspired by what you've written and kind of his challenge to really ask, where are all these voices? Why aren't we hearing them? And it was a little trepidatious at first because I thought, okay, here's someone who calls himself the angry Asian Buddhist. Maybe he's really mean. And of course, no, I mean, here's a picture of Aaron. So you get a picture sense of his personality beaming smile all the time, megawatt smile. So he was just championing this project from the very beginning. And I'm speaking in the past tense because very sadly, Aaron passed away in 2017 of cancer. So in many ways, this book is, I consider it in the lineage of Aaron, if you will, or it's inspired by his legacy and wants to very much continue his legacy. So on this point of anger, Aaron knew that angry Asian Buddhist was a provocative title, right? It's kind of like Asian Americans were often seen as this model minority. We're not supposed to rock the boat and we're not supposed to be angry. I mean, just consider how different of a valence angry Black Buddhist or angry Asian Muslim has compared to angry Asian Buddhist. He knew that and he chose that title deliberately to get people to sit up and take notice. Because the other thing is, if we don't expect Asian Americans to be angry, we also really don't expect Buddhists to be angry. We kind of had this stereotype of like this oriental monk figure or almost like no emotions, right? To totally imperturbable. And to Aaron, these stereotypes were actually very dehumanizing. The stereotype of the oriental monk, which might seem positive and then is actually can be very dehumanizing when people have normal emotions, including anger, and then are told, oh, that's not Buddhist. Like, you're not being authentic. Or no, you can't count as a Buddhist if you even have this emotion of anger. So he pushed back against that. And he was also pushing it back against stereotypes of this kind of superstitious immigrant stereotype that I mentioned briefly in the passage I read, this kind of idea that all Asian American Buddhists are just one sort of massive lump of people who all kind of do the same things and maybe they're more devotional or traditional as compared to white converts and so that kind of language is also of course very dehumanizing i mean we can link it now to thinking about covid as a china virus like the ways that asians are just seen as a horde a mass often as like sort of a heathen mass so these ideas have very deep historical roots, as we know, and they still continue to play out today. So Aaron, part of the anger was standing up against these issues, right? And then finally, a third stereotype that he was pushing back against is when he sort of coined himself, he called it the banana Buddhist. And here again, he was being very provocative, banana obviously being a racial slur about Asians who seem to be yellow on the outside, but white on the inside. And what he was saying was, let's say you have Asian Americans in predominantly white convert Buddhist communities. If we just say, oh, they're basically just white Buddhists who happen to look Asian, that's dismissing a lot of culture, a lot of how, people, how we are racialized as Asian Americans. So that also is dehumanizing in his own way. And there's this quote that I love that if I can just read it really briefly. Um, by Jeffrey Yang, he uses it to describe the angry Asian man, but I think it also really very much applies to Aaron's writing. It is occasionally angry, but primarily better described as open, passionate, and defiant about the rights of Asian Americans to be included, the need for Asian American voices to be heard, and the responsibility of Asian Americans to participate. So I would say that 
Anger can be a spark. Anger is energy or information. This is something I really learned from my supervisors while training as a chaplain, three Black Christian women who had experienced plenty of, you know, reasons for anger in their lifetimes, in their ancestors' lifetimes, and taught me that it can be used as energy, something we can transform. So I think that anger can be the spark, but generally it's not so useful to use it as a fuel just because we ourselves tend to be harmed. And if Buddhism really is about alleviating harm, which I think is something many Buddhists share, that aspiration, I would argue that Aaron may have like talked about anger as this kind of spark, but he really used loving kindness or what we call metta in the Buddhist tradition as his fuel. That was one of his meditation practices. Loving kindness is kind of an extending goodwill to all beings. So the anger was a skillful means or upaya, as we say in Buddhism. And, you know, and he himself was also very open about saying like, you know, sometimes I've messed up or sometimes I've been misinterpreted. He worried about that and he would apologize to people, you know, if they'd been hurt or he would really try to explain his words. And so to me, he always came from this place of love. And I hope that that comes across in my book as well, even if there is a flame on the cover. <laughs> yeah, um, that's, um, so provocative thinking about that um, juxtaposition of um, love and um, and anger together, um, and and I love how you put that as um, anger as a form of energy, right? And if you connect it with love, it's like love energy, right? In in some ways, um, I'm wondering if you could. Um, you know, as as you were talking, there was a lot there that you were. Um, that reminded me of this theme of two Buddhisms, which you keep on coming back to in your book and which is a, really a very um, common narrative in the academic literature on American Buddhism. And I would say not just um, in the academic literature, but I would say it's part of the consciousness of American Buddhism or really white American Buddhism. So. For those of us who are watching, I'm, I'm wondering if you could explain a little bit more what that concept means and, um, and, and how it shapes the way that we see and that we don't see Asian American Buddhists. Yeah, absolutely. Let me just read a short paragraph from page 10 because I think it summarizes it a bit. And you'll notice I'm using lots of scare quotes in this paragraph. The dominant story of Buddhism in America is that there are two Buddhisms the Buddhism of white converts and the Buddhism of Asian immigrants. What differentiates these two distinct and mutually isolated brands of Buddhism? We are told for starters that Western slash white Buddhists focus on meditation practices in keeping with their rational and modernist bent, whereas Asian slash Asian American Buddhists prefer the traditional and devotional rituals of chanting and bowing. It's not hard to guess which group is more likely to be dismissed as superstitious and which group is more likely to be celebrated as scientific. So this two Buddhism's way of categorizing American Buddhism, perhaps like all models, there's a kernel of truth or there can be some usefulness there, but really over the past few decades, I say a couple of decades at least, scholars have started to question the limits of this model, especially once it becomes racialized, which it may not have originally been intended to be a sort of racialized category. But I was noticing, in, especially in more popular representations, this kind of slippage where suddenly white convert meditating Buddhists seem to be the kind of superior Buddhists, what we call, would be called the future of American Buddhism. And these Asian immigrants suddenly seemed to be devotional, ritualistic, suddenly that slips into superstitious, that slips into backwards, stuck in their old ways, this kind of thing. Uh, that I felt that it was quite disturbing, of course, to see that, you know, as someone who was beginning to explore Buddhism at that time and who didn't want to see whole categories of people written off in this way. And furthermore, like many of my interviewees mentioned when kind of presented with this 
binary of two Buddhisms. We want to know where do we fit as Asian American converts? I have no idea. What about our Black Buddhist friends, our Latinx and Native friends? What about our mixed race Buddhist friends? Where do they fit? When these are sometimes presented as kind of the only two options, it can feel extremely confusing and limiting and frankly, quite disempowering. So there's a lot more I could say, but I guess in general, what I appreciated about having conversations with 89 different young adult Asian American Buddhists, I did 26 in-depth in-person interviews and 63 email interviews, is that we got to question this model and think about what are some other ways we can talk about actually the many Buddhisms and really the vast diversity and complexity of what it means to be Asian American Buddhists. We recognize that generally speaking, binaries, dichotomies are always going to be limiting. You could almost question any pair, right, of this, like Western and Asian. Well, Asians in the West, aren't we Western too, right? Meditation and ritual. Meditation is arguably a type of ritual, <laughs> like it is very ritualistic, even if you just keep returning to the breath. And so this is part of the book, I think, is challenging and breaking open this dichotomy to find more what I would consider culturally engaged ways of talking about Buddhism. In other words, we don't pretend there's this unmarked, you know, Buddhism of white converts. That's kind of the one that we compare the backwards Asian convert Buddhism to. And um, yeah, there's so much more to say. So I feel like I'm um, starting to ramble a little bit, but I think that this was certainly an impetus for the book, this two Buddhisms binary, and I think it is important to name it and to understand lots of people are questioning its limits. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Chen Xing. I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your own personal journey to writing this book and, and why you wrote it. Sure, yeah, I guess, um, Let's see, I was not raised Buddhist. I'm Chinese American, born in China, but came to the US when I was four and grew up in various parts of the US, including Pennsylvania and Washington state. And so my parents, like many people who lived through the cultural revolution were quite suspicious of religion. And I kind of grew up with that. But it was really after I took a gap year in high school before college, saw Buddhism in many forms in Asia, I felt curious about it. So that was sort of one of my entry points into Buddhism. And then another Another thread was certainly, I think, just suffering that I was quite depressed in high school. I was very burned out from the high school experience. And there's something about Buddhism in its just very honest way of talking about suffering being kind of a universal experience and that there's a possible end for that suffering. So there's that kernel of hope. So I heard from a lot of my interviewees, sometimes there's a mix of both being drawn to Buddhism out of a sense of curiosity, out of a sense of its beauty, whether it's because of the rituals or because of the peace that it seems to embody or various things. And also being drawn sometimes to this gateway of suffering. And so I remember in college in the Bay Area, starting to read more books about Buddhism and then wanting to just go to different communities to see, you know, can I see how this is actually lived off of the page, right? And I would go to some predominantly white convert communities and also some predominantly Asian immigrant communities. And so here there's a sort of two Buddhism psychotomy happening, right? But I would also go to BIPOC sanghas or some affinity groups. There weren't as many at that time, about 15 years ago, there are many more now. So affinity groups for people of color, um, which also don't fit very well in this two Buddhism psychotomy, right? And what I noticed, especially in the predominantly white sanghas uh, was that, well, there were very, very few other people of color, much less Asian Americans, and also very few young adults, actually. It was mostly the baby boomer generation. And then at Asian immigrant temples, at least there, people didn't say to me, like, oh, your English is so good, or some of these little moments that would give me a moment for pause. Um, but there, I also wasn't seeing a lot of young adults, often more just grandmothers and little grandkids. And so I just started wondering, where are all of these people? Do they even exist? And then if so, what can we learn if we center their experiences? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so important. Um, it's, um, Asian American Buddhists are so often erased from the narrative of American Buddhism, right? And if you look at any of these popular publications like Tricycle, Buddha Dharma, Shambhala Sun, um, Asian American writers' faces aren't anywhere to be found and particularly in secular mindfulness as well. 
Um, it's a it's a very white dominated practice. Um, so you talk about this experience of being a minority um, in these white sanghas, but then going to Asian um, immigrant Buddhist spaces and temples, and they're also being a minority as someone who's 1.5 second generation and being a young adult. Which leads me to the my next question is, you know, you write that um, that second generation Buddhists or heritage Buddhists often have a hard time claiming a Buddhist identity. And so can you explain this? I mean, we also know from the um, Pew Research Study um, on Asian Americans that um, among second generation Buddhists that um, about 40% actually leave, leave the faith, leave the religion. Um, and there are very few who actually, um, at least according to the study, convert. So if you can just talk about this, like uh, why um, give us more texture to understand the struggle in claiming a Buddhist identity among um, young adult Asian Americans, particularly those of who come from um, Buddhist families. Yeah, there are so many complex reasons I think that surfaced when talking to interviewees. You know, first of all, it's certainly not easy to be a racial minority in this country. Add to that being a religious minority, I think it's doubly more difficult. Buddhists are maybe only about 1% of the American population. And though it's true that about two thirds of that 1% are of Asian heritage, again, when you see mainstream depictions and they're predominantly white, there can be a feeling for second generation Buddhists that, oh, my Buddhism is just cultural mm -hmm. or, it's this question of who has the power to represent American Buddhism. As one of my interviewees, I think very eloquently put it, speaking up is a risk and not a right for many Asian Americans. I think of people being bullied in school, being discriminated against in school. Being Asian is not something that we can hide, can't walk around all day wearing a paper bag over my head, right? But being Buddhist, maybe if I'm not a monastic, if I don't have robes or a shaped head, maybe it is something that I can hide. So I think there are some really understandable reasons why people might not necessarily want to come out as Buddhist. And of course, that's not true across the board. Some people are very comfortable with their Buddhist identity, right? And are happy to you know, share that with other people. But it did strike me that a good number of interviewees did speak of some reluctance or, you know, people would talk about how they had another Asian American friend whom they knew for years. And, you know, maybe let's say one was Taiwanese and one was Vietnamese. And it wasn't until years into knowing them that they both discovered that they actually had been raised Buddhist. It just wasn't something that people talked about. And even in these interviews, the in-person ones lasted between an hour and a half and five and a half hours long. And I realized it's because for a lot of people, this was the first time that they really got to talk about and think about that intersection of being Asian American and being Buddhist. And I think if we've also put Asian American Buddhists within the context of Asian Americans, we are also definitely a minority in that space, right? Asian Americans are a plurality Christian actually followed by, you know, atheist, which is what I grew up as. And then so in a way I've chosen an even smaller minority category by becoming Buddhist that there may be only about one in seven Asian Americans are Buddhist. And so also people would talk about attempts by Christians and especially Asian American Christians in college, for example, to convert to Buddhism. And they could recognize that Asian American Christians are much more organized, they're much more dominant. You know, sometimes those churches really provide a sense of belonging. And there's so many campus groups for Asian American Christians, but I don't think, I don't even know if there are any specifically for Asian American Buddhists. I mean, you're lucky if a university even has a Buddhist community at all. So there's a way in which second generation Asian American Buddhists are navigating a lot. And it's kind of quite remarkable, you know, some of the questions was just, you know, how did you manage to stay with your faith? Because actually it's much easier just to leave. Yeah, well, I, you know, I was really struck by your, um, in your book by um, how, grateful people were that you took interest um, in them as Asian American Buddhists and how um, how happy they were to speak to you like how they really I, I just felt like this hunger among your um, among your research participants um, to, to really to share with you and and to find um, 
you know, to find someone who could share in their experience with you. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how um, young adult Asian American Buddhists are, you know, given this, given that they might not feel like they belong in white sanghas and they also might not belong in these Asian immigrant um, Buddhist temples, um, how are they finding creative ways of belonging? And the and if you could talk about the creative ways that they are reclaiming um, their faith. Yeah, that's a beautiful question. I want to say that, you know, I was also so grateful and happy to talk to all these people, because when you ask about my personal journey, this book came out of a place of some loneliness and confusion, of course, curiosity too, right? So it's like, oh, we're not alone. And I think to answer this question, it's helpful to briefly mention that the book is divided into four parts. And the first part is called Trailblazers. So that's really focused on the on Jodo Shinshu Buddhists who tend to be Japanese American. And for them, um, they, <clears throat> excuse me, water. many of them, I think, grew up with a sense of actually quite a bit of belonging in their communities. But in this community, it's rapidly diversifying. So it's not just Japanese American anymore. And they're grappling with, you know, reaching out and creating spaces that include Buddhists of other backgrounds or other sects or people who are just exploring, I think we can actually look to them for models of how people are creating ways of belonging that are culturally rooted, but also inviting and universal and specific. So for the second part of my book, which is really focused on what I call second gen Asian American Buddhists, people who are Asian Americans who are raised by Asian American Buddhist parents who came to this country, you know, I in the book I talk about them forming youth groups and especially youth groups where English is the predominant language. So their parents or grandparents may have Khmer or Lao or Thai or Chinese as their first language, but that can make the temple experience feel a little alienating if you're not fluent in that language. So creating these spaces for youth to kind of explain Buddhism in a way that is understandable and relatable for them, right? I think service is a big component of that, of that as well. Um, and then I think for the third part of my book, which is, I say is about quote unquote first gen or convert Buddhists. In other words, they're the first generation to be Buddhist in their family. Like myself, that can also be like, we haven't had the experience of growing up in temple. We don't even know how to bow or these things that second generation Buddhists are often just blessed to have learned as a matter of course. And so for them, I think in these predominant often Maybe if you enter Buddhism through predominantly white convert communities, there's also a forming of affinity groups, but also just this curiosity of how do we form solidarities across racial groups. So I think that I think it's still very much an identity that's still in the making Asian American Buddhists, right? We're playing with the limits and possibilities of this category. And I think even just as a first step, people starting to realize oh, like we're not alone. We're kind of part of this big Buddhist family where we don't necessarily know all the members of this family. Um, the family is actually very diverse. There's tensions and fractures even within this family. Maybe parts of this family are estranged, but I see this growing interest of asking like, well, when we use Buddhism as our common ground, how can we start understanding some of our pain points, the points where we've been hurt and also how can we start healing some of those pain points so to give a very concrete example um, on May 4th which will be exactly 49 days after the Atlanta shootings there's going to be a national Buddhist memorial ceremony for Asian American ancestors and I'm helping to co-organize this with Dr. Duncan Williams and also Dr. Funi Su but we're bringing together Buddhists from a wide range of different Asian lineages and it's you know, it feels actually quite historic because we also have the endorsements from hundreds of people from Asian American Buddhist communities, but also from out what we're calling ally Buddhist communities, people of other backgrounds, and also just from individuals of lots of different religious or even non-religious backgrounds. And for us, it's kind of a statement of healing, of solidarity. And, you know, it's, it's just really... Um, exciting actually to be in this time even as there's been so much hurt and trauma and pain during this time because I see a kind of reclaiming a kind of pushing back against dominant narratives with two Buddhisms or pushing back um, 
if I can, I just, there's this quote that I really love on page 213. I think if I can read it. Um, so this is from Tassa, who's a Sri Lankan Buddhist, and she's responding actually to a Chinese American Buddhist. So already that kind of like intersectarian, interethnic dialogue, I think that young people are so interested in. It feels like such a rich ground for forming just deeper spiritual friendship. So she says, at Lirio, I can't begin to tell you how much your words mean to me. I too often feel like I don't know enough about the texts and history of Buddhism when faced with the white Buddhist establishment. I'm so sorry you have had to endure the silencing and racism you described. I have not interacted extensively with the white Buddhist community, and so I have been spared some of the more painful realities of that in some ways. I used to think that I didn't know as much as they do about Buddhism, and then I realized the history and context of Buddhism is written on my body, it's molded in my skin, it flows in my blood, it filled the air I breathed when I was born in Sri Lanka. We have everything we need right here. I hope you keep writing about your Buddhist experience as well. I would love for us to continue being in conversation. And when Aaron read this as the angry Asian Buddhist, his response was, sometimes it feels as though I'm the only Asian American Buddhist blogger out there, but it's times like these that remind me I'm not alone. There are hundreds of thousands of Asian American Buddhists in this country, and we are ready to speak out and stand up for our inclusion, dignity, and respect. Thank you so much, Tenshing. Um, that there, you gave us so much food for thought there. Um, I want to. I just want to be careful, the mindful of the time, and I know that we want to turn to the audience for um, who I, I think uh, for Q and A right now. There's a couple of questions, uh, some comments that could be questions. Uh, should I just read them? Um, okay, so one is, uh, I have noticed this in several faith backgrounds, Christianity, Ju Judaism, Islam, etc., that some con congregations lose uh, people in their 20s and 30s and then regain individuals back again in their late 30s to 40s age range. Uh, is that a trend and why is that? <laughs> I know for um, Jodo Shinshu Buddhists, they often talk about that. And I write about that in my book as well. You know, people are off in college and they may not be close to the temple that they grew up in. So it's understandable that this phenomenon would happen and that people would come back to it. And I think also Buddhism, some of its concerns around, you know, old age, sickness, death might perhaps appeal more to older people, but not exclusively. So I think that there is this trend and perhaps Caroline can speak to this as well, you know, as a sociologist, but that it's part of the picture and, you know, not the full picture. Okay. Uh, yeah, let me just say something briefly that, yes, this is a, um, what um, this person is noticing is a, a life cycle trend that we tend to see among most religions um, that in the young adulthood stage that people um, are leaving religion and then come back again, usually oftentimes during the form during when people start families um, and they religion helps people raise families. Um, and then they often come back again um, when they uh, are um, getting older and maybe about to die. So it's a it's it's very rare that you'd have the same kind of level of religiosity or religious participation throughout your entire life. And then there's another question. Um, let's see. A comment and a question tied in. Uh, aggressive Christian missionizing and proselytizing as a form of systemic faithism is an all too consistent fellow traveler with anti Asian racism, uh, though often goes unspoken, uh, unacknowledged, and unaddressed. How does that set of shared lived realities and experiences help frame Asian American Buddhist expression, life and world view? Okay. There's a complex question. I think yeah. it is always important to remember that Buddhism is also a missionizing religion and that, you know, it's 
meant to be universal and it's spread over 2,600 years to different countries. And so there is that actually that it shares in common with Christianity. I think that here, I mean, I think my interviewees, you know, I myself am always very aware that and so there are people in this nation who would like to think, see it as a white Christian supremacist nation. So that is a context that we live in. And then for many of my interviewees, myself as well, we are hoping to kind of stake a claim for this nation as actually a place that's multi-religious and a place that is multi-racial as well. So this is, yeah, this is a really complex question, but I think that certainly, um, I don't know, I, I appreciated very much someone named Doma in my book who was grew up Nepali Buddhist and who talked about these some of these dynamics of having a cousin, for example, who converted to Christianity. And actually many people in their community actually felt like outraged, like you grew up Buddhist, how could you? But for Doma, she said, you know, my it was just the faith that felt right to her. That's where her affinities drew her to. And so similarly, I think like that there's, truth of there can be like a lot of violence and tensions. And I think I also just want to lift up that there are definitely people, I think, you know, Asian American Christians who've expressed support for my book and are concerned and want to address some of those more aggressive proselytizing methods when they can cause harm or can cause ostracization and can feel like there are sort of a, you know, maybe almost like racist strands there. So. I almost feel like we have a whole co separate conversation about this question, but I appreciate the question. Another question. In your research and interviews, did you come upon narratives of transnational adoptees raised by white parents? I am a transnational transracial queer adoptee from China and wonder about the complexities of Western heritage Buddhism from white caregiver uh, parents. I would love to see a whole book on this. Thank you so much for sharing this perspective. Um, yeah, I think I do quote like one or two people who would fall into that category. And yeah, this it's so complex. You know, it's not the central focus of my book because I was just trying to bring together a very broad diversity of voices. But I think for some people it's, you know, it's it's different to be, um, so for example, Reverend Bien Shu in the book was um, adopted from Vietnam and she writes quite eloquently of just emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, what it was like to be raised, I think from a very young age, actually within a Vietnamese Buddhist context, but then, you know, to be, I believe she was raised Christian, um, I may be wrong, but then to return to Buddhism, oh, through a predominantly white convert community. So there are so many extra layers of complexity there, you know, that someone like myself who was raised in a Chinese, by Chinese parents couldn't fully understand. But yeah, I think remembering how diverse, complex, what it means to be Asian American is, how diverse and complex what it means to be Buddhist is, once we put those things together, you know, I'm writing this book not so we can sort of all come together in sort of monolithic way and say, this is who we are, but I think so that we can actually understand deeply some of our differences and hopefully through that understanding, we can heal some of the tensions that exist, frankly, within the Asian American community and even within the Buddhist community. And then there's another question. Uh, what role, if any, does anger play, which you addressed earlier, uh, in Buddhism for you or the people you spoke with, particularly when it seems that a major aspect of Buddhism is about letting go of attachments? I think I spoke to this more at the beginning, but yeah. yeah, like I think recognizing that like all emotions, it's sort of an impermanent state that comes and goes. But, you know, I think about how sometimes if we really ignore anger or try to bypass it, that can cause more harm than good. I think about how it's generally not helpful to expect Buddhists to go around completely free of emotions as if we're robots, which then just plays into another unfortunate stereotype of Asian Americans, for example. But you know, I think about how it felt to watch the George Floyd video. And I think of all the emotions that came up around that. And I think that if someone hadn't felt some kind of anger or grief or like some kind of emotion, I would be pretty worried because sometimes our anger rises just because in the face of when we feel compassion for an injustice, that's where our anger arises. So I think I just want to recognize it's a human emotion. And as Buddhists, you know, we 
are all doing the best we can as humans. We're all trying to alleviate the kind of inevitable suffering that happens in our life. So that would be my response. And I do recognize that it's a tricky topic within Buddhist circles because it is very important not to, I think, sometimes feed anger, right? But again, using anger as energy, as information that then we can transform into skillful action that doesn't harm ourselves or other people. And then there's um, another question. Uh, do you think there is an appropriate way to build a grand Buddhist narrative in which every American Buddhist can find themselves? and keep their own narratives at the same time? I really like this question. I might be inclined to say maybe no, <laughs> because you know, you sort of like, it's like one narrative to rule them all. So if you had a thousand narratives and you wanted one narrative to rule them all, then you just have a thousand and one narratives. <laughs> but I do think there's ways we can talk about Buddhism in more nuanced ways that can feel more inclusive for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I had a related question with regards to um, um, how different communities and their churches respond to group trauma or racism, uh, such as Japanese American uh, internment uh, affected uh, Japanese American Buddhism and their practices, and uh, and comparing that with let's say more recent Southeast Asian uh, Buddhist groups that that enter, you know, th 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 there's like big differences between them, you know. Um, have, have you looked into those types of comparisons in, in your studies or, yeah? I think something that really strikes me about the May 4th gathering, and just for people who are interested, the website is www.maywegather.org. So it'll just be freely live streamed on May 4th, um, next Tuesday, actually at four o'clock Pacific time. But we are bringing all these different communities together, you know, including multi generational Japanese American communities, also more recent communities from Southeast Asia, East Asia. And what really strikes me is that all of these communities have actually ritual and ceremony that provide really powerful healing, chanting, you know, that's deeply rooted. And it's interesting to contrast this with more sort of mindfulness that is often now a way that people learn about, maybe not even Buddhism, because often the Buddhist roots of that are completely erased. But um, sometimes the secular mindfulness can feel much more like individualized in its purpose, like if it's just for calming myself. And I think what ritual and ceremony does, it's like when we're in a space and we're chanting together, we are one voice of many, right? When we bow or when we smell the incense, I think that is actually just a really powerful experience of our interconnectedness. We understand that we are part of something much broader. And I think what these communities do really beautifully is precisely these chants and rituals and that they, you know, and they may not immediately understand each other's languages, but you would realize, oh, they're taking refuge in the Buddha Dharma and the Sangha, or, oh, this is a chanting of a loving kindness meditation. Or so again, this Buddhist family, we can find our common roots, even if we don't always literally speak the same language. Another question, for folks that did not grow up practicing Buddhism, what advice do you have for them to explore and live a Buddhist life? Um, I think just, you know, follow your curiosity and follow the sense of maybe where your affinities take you. I remember when I was first starting to explore Buddhism and I asked the Buddhist teacher, like, what books must I read, right? And maybe in Maybe for Christianity, there's the Bible, but then there's so many Buddhist sutras and texts. And I was thinking like, I wanted like the definitive canon or something to read. And he just said, you know, it's very hard to recommend books because every person is so different. Every person's affinities are gonna be really different. And I remember at the time being like a little put out by that answer, but in retrospect, I'm so grateful because it gave me space to just be open and explore. So my advice is there's no one right way to do Buddhism, but you know, find places where you feel some sense of belonging where you feel some kind of nourishment where you can imagine yourself forming deeper spiritual friendships. In Buddhism, we say often that spiritual friendship or kalyana mitta is the whole of the spiritual path. So find those friends and allow yourself to be open and surprised. How are the trans-Pacific interactions between Asian Buddhism and Asian American Buddhism shaping the racialized reality of religion in the US? Are there any positive developments happening? Trans-Pacific interactions. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's such a part of many Asian American Buddhists experience. They're just connected to Asia in different ways. And I think even, you know, we mentioned secular mindfulness, like the history of that comes from Burma, from Thailand. So Asian actors in Asia have very much shaped the types of meditation practices we inherit now. And this goes against a sort of more simplified narrative of, oh, Buddhism was brought to America in the 1960s and 70s by white converts who studied with Asia. In fact, it's all much more complex. So I think that there's, a, you know, this is that's a big question, but I think like Asian American Buddhism already is trans-Pacific Buddhism. And I think there's a way in which, yeah, there's, it's no accident that the second part of this book is called Bridge Builders. Like we are building those bridges. Our lives are already very much for many of us tied to Asia. Then I think we have one final question. Uh, do you find any evidence of historical or contemporary uh, geopolitical conflicts or related underlying rivalries manifesting as obstacles or getting expressed in interviewees uh, Buddhist journey, such as China, Tibet, Vietnam, China, Japan, Vietnam, Cambodia, Vietnam, et cetera. Yes, I think the short answer would be yes. So to give a concrete answer, for example, Detinu, who grew up in you know, Sri Lanka in America and Singhalese, talks, talked about grappling with being very concerned about um, Buddhist nationalism in Sri Lanka and the implications of that, right? Right now, things in Burma. So I think, yes, young adults are concerned are very much concerned about that. I know that you know people who are Chinese and Taiwanese American thinking about China in Tibet. So there is something very unique about being in America and being Buddhist in the sense that you know, like if you live in LA, for example, you get to rub shoulders with so many different Asian American Buddhists that generally wouldn't be in such close quarters in Asia. And there's a way in which we're all racialized as Asian American. I think that can be disempowering in some ways, but it can also be really empowering because we suddenly get this opportunity to understand other people's complex histories, to understand, you know, the ways that our own maybe heritages that we came from historically sometimes have also been oppressors and not just the oppressed. So I think all of those complexities are being taken into account by, by young Buddhists as well. And that was our last question. And I was just wondering if uh, Carolyn, uh, had any questions to add just based on uh, attendees comments or well, you know what I do have one question that I'm dying to ask um, if we just have time we can make, make it really brief um, you know the story of how you come to the title of your book um, be the refuge is really moving um, and I'm wondering if you can explain to us what that title be the refuge means and especially what it means for Asian Americans and Asian American Buddhists now at this moment of heightened anti-Asian violence right now. Yeah, you know, when I was writing this book, which went through many iterations, I didn't have Be the Refuge as a title at first. And the title came about actually, like so much of this book was from Aaron again. So actually the very first blog he was a part of was a group blog called Dharma Folk. And then out of that, he started writing The Angry Asian Buddhist. But towards the very end of his life, when he was going through really intensive chemo, he actually started a new blog and it was called Be the Refuge. And for him, it was very personal. It was him realizing, you know, he could lean into his own Buddhist practices, his meditation practices in the hospital and through just little things like thanking everyone who came in to his room or trying to just be friendly to everyone, how he could actually be a refuge for himself, but also for the people around him. You know, he helped us organize bone marrow drives so that we could kind of feel a sense of a way of being a refuge that if this was something that wouldn't save him, he said it could still save many other lives. And so I see us together as continuing to author the blog posts of Be the Refuge. And by author, I mean it in a sense very writ large it doesn't necessarily literally mean that we're writing blog posts or even books as in this case, but we do it just in our everyday actions or sometimes inactions when we refrain from doing something harmful or when we do something positive. And for me, it's just a powerful um, addition to a Buddhist literature that seems so dominated by books that could be titled Go Meditate Now. And maybe being the refuge is 
you know, may look like meditation in one moment, but it also might just look like cooking a meal for someone and sharing it with them or having a cup of tea with someone who you're having a conflict with. And you say to them, I care enough about this friendship to just let's, let's try to work things out, right? Let's try to continue these karmic bonds of spiritual friendship to put it in Buddhist terms. So Be the Refuge is really both, I would say, an invitation and a challenge. It's easier said than done, but it's a way for us all to figure out kind of creatively how we can be refuge, create a sense of safety, home, and belonging for ourselves and then our loved ones and indeed for all beings. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for uh, explaining that title. It's very relevant to our times. Um, I want to thank Chen Sing Han for her presentation, uh, Carolyn Chen for her assistant, uh, Kat Sen for uh, uh, organizing the technical part. Uh, please join Eastwind Books in future readings. Our website is www.asiabookcenter.com. May 22nd, if you want to learn about cooking, we have an instant pot Asian pressure cooker meals, fast, fresh, and affordable, uh, featuring author Patricia Tanumi Harja. And June 26th, uh, we have a uh, uh, performer, singer, artist, no Nobuko Miyamoto, uh, to present her book, Not Yo Butterfly, my long song of relocation, race, love, and revolution. Uh, one final announcement, uh, Chen Seng Han's book, uh, signed copies are available at www.asiabookcenter.com. And thanks everybody, thanks the audience for coming and um, enjoy the rest of, the, of your day, thank you. Thank you, everyone.